Welcome back to One Piece Explained. Today we're taking a deep dive into episode 2 of the One Piece live action adaptation by Netflix and Tomorrow Studios. Thank you so much for your support on the first episode breakdown as well as your patience with me as I take my time going through the whole season. There are a ton of little details in here and I've been having so much fun with it going through it and as always if you notice something I missed or didn't cover in this video let me know in the comments. I love reading what you all have to say and if you've been enjoying my breakdowns of the live action series I'd appreciate it if you subscribe so you can help grow the channel and get the breakdowns as soon as they come out. Of course, I make these live action videos with the intent of being interesting and engaging for old and new fans alike. As such, I won't be talking explicitly about certain secrets or mysteries found in the story of One Piece that are much better experienced at your own pace, but I will talk about the existence of certain characters, places, story arcs, etc. in a general sense. And with that said, let's get into the breakdown. This episode is titled The Man in the Straw Hat, which refers to both Luffy and his mentor figure Shanks as we see Luffy internalize and apply the various lessons he learned from Shanks during his childhood. And of course, you have Buggy the Clown, who by the end of this episode bears a grudge against both Shanks and Luffy, and his actions act as the connective tissue for paralleling various scenes between Shanks in the flashback and Luffy in present day. And I don't mean to do a full-blown review here, but... I think this was a very clever and well-written episode, just because of how well they were able to balance the significance of Luffy's flashback with the events of the Orange Town arc by finding all these cool little connective tissues. So this episode starts off with a continuation of the Romance Dawn flashback as we saw a young Luffy practice his gum gum pistol, a nod to him doing so during his flashback on Mount Corvo in the source material. The bottle that he's practicing on reads Old Cactus Whiskey, and unlike the bottle we saw in last episode, this one seems to be imported from Logetown. Now this could also be a nod to Cactus Island, where the town of Whiskey Peak is located. There's another bottle here on the counter that reads Rum Clement. Now, Rum Clement is a type of real alcohol in our real world, but it was also what Gold Roger drank during an anime-only flashback that took place during the Logetown arc. Shanks arrives and announces that he's setting sail, and on his hip you can spot his sword, Griffin, first named in Volume 87's SBS. This is a neat detail, because in the source material, Shanks had a different unnamed sword all the way back in Chapter 1, while Griffin is the sword that he's been using since Chapter 234. Notice the difference in hilts. We cut back to present day where the crew is sailing at night, and Nami cracks the code on the chest they stole from the marine base in Shellstown, and the contents are very interesting. We have a Baroque works card, perhaps the one that was on Mr. Seven before Zoro killed him and turned him in, or just one that Morgan had around for some other reason. As I mentioned in the last breakdown, the marines seem to have known about Baroque works for quite a while in this show. There's also of course the map to the Grand Line inside the case, but underneath is a confidential file that says property of the world government, and above it reads absolute justice. The idea of what justice is and who is just is a central theme that runs throughout One Piece, and various characters have their own specific senses of justice. Most marines hold the default philosophy of absolute justice. Morgan also has the bounty poster for Kuro, the captain of the Black Cat Pirates that he mentioned in the last episode, and he was extremely proud of defeating him as evidenced by him keeping Kuro's poster among his safe of valuable and confidential items. I keep saying this, but how this show is able to make the East Blue Saga feel even more interconnected than it was in the source material is just great. Nami opens up the map to the Grand Line, and it contains mostly just locations that we saw on the maps from the previous episode, but it also introduces the Red Line, a strip of continent that runs across the world, perpendicular to the Grand Line, and divides the oceans of the world. And toward the bottom of the map is Reverse Mountain, where currents from the four seas converge and allow entry to the Grand Line. When they find themselves under attack, Luffy thinks quickly and swallows the map. We haven't seen Luffy do something exactly like this in the source material. However, we have seen Luffy swallow some other strange objects and be able to take them back out, so this isn't that far of a stretch. This sequence also features the first of many outfit changes the Straw Hats will undergo throughout the show. The creators and costume designers have looked through various pieces of the source material to find all of these great outfits. Zoro is wearing a version of the outfit he wore in his original appearance in this show, but with the color now being a nod to his post time skip outfit. Luffy's shirt is a little bit harder to place though. You could say it's inspired from his appearance on the chapter 198 color spread, however that shirt is a long sleeve shirt. It's actually closer in design to his shirt in the chapter 287 color spread, though the accents on that shirt are black and not red. I think this may actually be a custom shirt that is a variation of the design he had as a kid during chapter 1 of the manga. In the anime, the shirt's colorway is actually inverted, with the accents being blue and the anchor being red, while in the manga, the accents are red and the anchor is blue. 
The shirt worn by young Luffy in this show follows the anime's color scheme, and I think the shirt in this scene is a variation of the manga shirt with the anchor design removed and instead replaced with the text reading Marvelous Noon on the back. Now this text actually comes from the shirt worn by Shanks in the color spread of chapter 28, and I think this kind of plays well into the whole idea of Shanks teaching Luffy all these lessons, and then Luffy eventually being able to reciprocate those lessons and show how much he's learned in this episode. The title card is designed after Buggy the Clown, who is of course the primary antagonist in this episode. The Jolly Roger is replaced with Buggy's iconic design, and the eye in peace is one of his hand blades. In Buggy Circus, we meet Moji, who doesn't actually get named in the series, nor does he have any dialogue. In the source material, he's a lion tamer with his pet lion Richie, who didn't make it into the show, but we do see a nod to him later on in the episode in the room Zoro and Nami are being held captive, as we can see an image of him with Moji. The bit where Luffy recognizes Buggy, but can't get his name right and calls him Binky, is a nod to a scene in the anime where Luffy meets Buggy once again and just can't place his name. He calls him Boogie later on in this episode as well. Buggy tries to correct him and calls himself the Flashy Fool and the Genius Jester, a nod to his most recent epithet in the source material. I also love the way that they adapted the bit where he's very sensitive about his nose, which looks really great by the way. A lot of Buggy's dialogue in this episode is written as if he's in a theatrical production, and I think this whole captive audience thing is just genius. I love how they did it. Buggy threatens the crew for the map to the Grand Line, and says if he doesn't get it, he'll have to offer his crew a pound of flesh, and gestures to this crewmate with the sharpened teeth. Now this may be a subtle nod to Buggy's cover story, where he saves his crew from a group of cannibals, the Kumate tribe, and perhaps this crewmate is actually a Kumate tribesman himself. Nami tries to escape the situation by leaving Luffy as a distraction, an adaptation of when she betrays Luffy and turns him into to Buggy in the source material. She runs outside the big top and is faced with the destruction of the town. I love this scene in particular, as it's a great way of showing the actual threat the Buggy pirates are after establishing them as this joke-ridden circus act. Nami is terrified of the destruction she sees here, likely reminding her of the destruction she's seen in her own hometown, and all of this destruction was likely done by the Buggy Ball that Buggy boasts so proudly of in the source material. This ends up with her being put in a cage, a flip on her actions in the manga leading Luffy to be caged instead. Now we cut back to Shellstown and get this gorgeous shot of the marine base, and I forgot to include this in my previous breakdown, but you can actually make out the statue of Captain Morgan on the top of the base, just like in the source material. In the courtyard, we see Ukari tied up to the post, likely ordered by Morgan for letting Nami steal his uniform and sneak into the marine base, and with this, we start our adaptation of the Kobe Meppo cover story. Back at the big top, Buggy has been torturing Luffy, and we see an adaptation of Mare Boodle being forced to operate the torture device. Mare Boodle had a larger role in the source material, and it's been cut down to this, but I still love that they kept him here just to operate this device. Buggy reveals that he used to be on a pirate crew with Shanks and was betrayed by him. This may be a nod to the reason he gives for hating Shanks during the Orangetown arc, but we later learn that Shanks asked Buggy to join his crew, and we just recently learned the real reason for Buggy feeling betrayed and declining that offer. I love that this episode nods more toward the recent developments in the manga, as it really fleshes out Buggy's hatred for Shanks, whereas in the original Orangetown arc, it felt a lot more flat. And one comparison that I thought was cool, Luffy is able to slip out of the straps, similar to how he did during the Water 7 arc. Kabaji enters and begins to torture Zoro. He states that Zoro hunted him and his brother across the Goa Kingdom, the country where Luffy is from, and ended up killing his brother. This is an entirely new addition and was not from the source material. Kabaji also describes Zoro as some kind of demon, a nod to how he was described upon introduction in the manga. Back in Shellstown, we get Garp confronting Kobe about his enlistment. This plot of not trusting Kobe was likely inspired by the Marines' initial hesitancy toward Kobe in the source material, and I love that this is being expounded upon here with Garp. In the back, under Morgan's mirror, you can make out a couple of medals and ribbons. I really like this inclusion, because we don't often get explicitly decorated marines in the source material. The most notable example I can think of is Sengoku, who was the fleet admiral, among a few others. So it's really cool to see them play this up a bit more in the live action. And of course, it helps add a bit more to Morgan's vanity and sense of self-importance. Back in the flashback, we get the adaptation of Luffy and Shanks' encounter with the Lord of the Coast, and Shanks uses a special technique. I'm leaving this vague, of course, to preserve the experience of putting together what this actually is for any new fans who may be going through the series for the first time. And speaking of new fans, I've seen some think that this is a Devil Fruit ability, which is really interesting, because in the source material, Shanks is actually in the water during this whole sequence, and as we're told, Devil Fruit users lose the ability to swim. However, in the live action, Shanks is never in the water during any of this sequence. Even when saving Luffy, he simply just pulls him out of the water. You may be thinking, surely he had to swim to get to Luffy, as there's no other boat anywhere nearby. But... If you look at Shanks, he looks pretty dry relative to Luffy. 
other than his arm, of course, that he used to pull Luffy out of the water, the same arm that would be eaten in just a moment. Now, in the source material, Shanks does have a habit of just suddenly appearing in places, which has caused years of speculation on how he does this. Of course, it could just be chalked up to how these stories tend to be told. Cool characters show up at the right place at the right time. But there could be something more to this, and I'm not going to speculate on what exactly. I just think that this could be something cool to look back on should we get more revelations about Shanks in the future in the source material. I also think it's a lot of fun that this show leaves it more of a mystery whether Shanks is a devil fruit power or not. I remember all those years of speculating what Shanks' mysterious ability was in the manga until we got the explanation, and this was a great time back then, so to be able to recreate that mystery in some form for these new fans is fantastic. Part of the magic of a series like One Piece is the week-to-week -week mysteries that can end up taking years to get paid off on. I also really like how Shanks' pupil gets smaller as he uses this technique, which in turn reverts the Lord of the Coast's enraged pupil into a larger, more docile one. In the source material, we would learn that this is how Sea King's eyes look when they go berserk when Arlong's pupils change to a similar shape. But if you read the Viz translation, you might miss this because of how it's phrased, whereas I believe the original intention is maintained in the anime. And just for reference, the Viz translation took a lot of strange liberties back then, but it is much more accurate and faithful to the original Japanese text in present day, thanks to the efforts of the current translator. Back in present day, Zoro and Nami make quick work of Kabaji, and Zoro asks Nami for her plan, and she answers with beating up every clown they see, a nice inversion of their exchange when they were trapped inside the crate at the start of the episode. On their way out, if you look a little to the right of the aforementioned drawing of Richie, you can actually make out a bunch of images of the Buggy Pirates taken directly from the manga. This is a really neat nod to those characters because most of Buggy's crewmates in this series seem to be original designs. So let's go through this. Of course, we have Buggy himself right here in his iconic introductory pose. To his right, we have the guy who Buggy killed for thinking he made fun of his nose, and above him is this guy with the jester's cap and two knives that attack Nami. Above them are a group of crewmates who are shocked when Luffy calls out Buggy's nose, and below Buggy is this panel of Buggy's crew when he's hyping them up after being clowned on by the Straw Hats. To the right is one of the crewmates that were cheering for Kabaji, and to his left are the rest of the crewmates from that panel. This is some serious attention to detail here, and I love it. The set designers and VFX artists did a great job with all these crazy Easter eggs. Let's get into Buggy's powers real quick. So, he ate the Chop Chop fruit, which lets his body split apart, effectively making him an uncuttable human. And we see him do a lot of this technique where he splits his entire body apart and has them fly around. Though unnamed, this is likely the Chop Chop Festival. The one key difference of the Chop Chop fruit between this series and the source material, however, is that here, Buggy is able to levitate his feet, whereas in the manga, that is one of the big drawbacks of the fruit. This was first realized by Luffy during the Orange Town arc and is what he exploited to overcome Buggy. Luffy tells Buggy that he can put seawater on him and he'll let it slide, but hurting his friends is where he draws the line, hearkening back to Shanks' handling of Higuma during Luffy's flashback. And he delivers a gum gum pistol that is ineffective against Buggy due to his powers. This is also a bit of a departure from the source material, as the Chop Chop fruit allows a bit of immunity against cutting attacks, whereas blunt impacts still work. Though, this could be an adaptation of Buggy's evasive techniques where he removes a part of his body before the impact of an enemy attack connects. This would also explain why the piece that is removed is in a perfect circle instead of the shape of Luffy's fist. Buggy sends out a Chop Chop Cannon, but in the source material, this usually just involves displacing his hands and not most of his limbs like here. Also note, the earlier Viz translation called this technique the Harpoon for whatever reason. Luffy calling out the crates to Nami as a means of counterattacking Buggy reminded me a bit of Luffy hinting to Zoro about flipping the cannon in the source material. There also seems to be a particular weakness of Buggy's power in the live action, as it seems that he can be skewered or pierced, whereas in the source material, his fruit allows him immunity to this. Ultimately, they do adapt the climax of the Orange Town arc from the source material, where Nami ties up his limbs, forcing Buggy to reassemble himself in a miniature form, at which point Luffy's able to send him flying with the Gum Gum Bazooka, and I love how they translated this move into the live action. I think it's one of Luffy's coolest base moves myself. Luffy opts to liberate the town, showing Nami that Luffy truly is a different kind of pirate. And back in Shellstown, we see a world government flag, which we wouldn't see this in the source material until hundreds of chapters later. Garp has snuffed out the dishonesty that was plaguing the base as he hinted at earlier during his conversation with Kobe, and Morgan is now tied up instead of Bukhari, and this is an adaptation of the Kobe Meppo cover story where the Shellstown Marine base ends up capturing Morgan after his defeat to have him escorted by Garp and face sentencing by Marine headquarters. Garp gives a speech addressing how in order to defeat piracy they must take away their dreams. This can be seen as a nod to Oda's general philosophy throughout One Piece as stated in an SBS from Volume 4. The reason why Luffy doesn't kill his enemies is because shattering their dreams and beliefs is tantamount to death. Over in Orangetown, the townsfolk are now liberated and we get a shot of this dog, a reference to Shushu from the source material who played a bit more of a central role in the story. 
The ending of this episode may feel a little bit odd, as Luffy is portrayed as the explicit savior of the town, while in the source material, only Mayor Boodle and Shushu are aware of their efforts to defeat Buggy, and the town drive out the Straw Hat crew, whereas here, the town thanks them and sends them off. What's more, in the source material, Luffy hates being seen as a hero because from his perspective, heroes have to share their food, which is what he ends up doing in this episode. This all can be seen as mischaracterizations of Luffy, and I can't really argue that it's not, but like with most other things in this adaptation, this is just a different take on the character, and he's not going to be one-to-one -one with the Luffy that we know from the source material. This is also probably done to parallel the scene of Shanks departing from Windmill Village. Next to Makino, we see Whoopslap, the mayor of Windmill Village, and besides him, it may be the adaptations of the fishmonger Gyoru that we talked about in the previous breakdown, and his wife Chicken. You can see a sign for bait and tackle behind him. Luffy and Shanks exchange some words before Shanks sets sail, and on this box you can make out some text that reads Shipwright Tools up top, and below it it may read Galley Law Co., short for Galley Law Company, a company consisting of some of the best shipwrights located on the island of Water 7. We get the iconic passing of the straw hat to Luffy, and cut back to present day with Nami stitching it up after Buggy damages it during their fight, just like in the source material. She returns to the cabin of the ship and takes out a transponder snail variant that is unique to this series, a baby snail that can fit inside your ear. These snail airpods, or snail pods, are a really cool modern reimagination of Oda's world, and I'm curious if these will actually make it into the main story at some point. We have some semblance of in-ear wireless communication going on in the current arc of One Piece during Egghead, so who knows? And if you pay attention to the ringing noise it makes, it sounds very similar to the ringing sound of the transponder snails in the anime. And of course, we have the credit sequence in this episode, which now includes a map of the Oregon Islands where Orange Town is located, and the island of rare animals beneath it. This was the first chapter after the Orangetown arc took place in the manga, but it's also where Buggy ends up visiting briefly during his cover story after he's sent flying by Luffy. There's also another map where Kumatea Island is visible. This is where Buggy reunites with his crew in said cover story, and it's where the aforementioned cannibals come from. You can also see Buggy's captain hat up top, as well as his hand blades below, and I like that the hat is covering up the next destination in our story, the Gecko Islands. And that's about it for this episode. A lot less stuff in this one than in the first episode, but that makes sense as this one was contained to two specific settings for the most part, and there were way less maps to look through. If you made it through this video, thank you. I appreciate your support. And like I said, if there's anything you want to point out, let me know in the comments. I love reading through what you all find. If you're not subscribed yet, I'd appreciate it if you do. The episode 3 breakdown will be out in the next few days. Thank you all for watching, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.